Okay, and we're online again. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, thank you once again for coming and joining us. Um, I hope that you are all having uh, a good day. Um, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, um, good time, wherever it is in the world that you are. Um, <laughs> um, and I hope you're all looking forward to the last of our little uh, online photogrammetry sessions for a while. Um, and hopefully you guys have also been uh, getting getting some good stuff going on with your homework um, this week. We've certainly uh, enjoyed looking at the models, um, the meshes that you guys have been sending over to the Facebook group. Um, so thank you for that. Um, we're going to cover a couple of the questions that people have been asking or that we've picked up on on this session and on the last class as well, actually. So let's. Uh, this is what we're going to do uh, today. Uh, we'll have a quick review of the homework. Um, we are going to look at the next step, which is building the photogrammic, uh, the photographic texture onto your mesh that you've made so far. And then we're going to look at how to publish your model. Um, this is the important bit. How do you actually stick it onto Facebook so that you can show everyone in the world what you've done? <laughs> the most important part. Everybody knows that's the most important part. Absolutely. Yeah, it, it, it's, uh, you know, if, if, you, if you bake a cake, it didn't happen unless you, you put a photo of it on Facebook. So it's... Uh, um, and then we'll have a little chat about the steps needed to take photogrammetry underwater. And then we'll be looking again at our blatant plugs and the discounts that we've arranged uh, off the back of the class. So without further ado, I'll let Case uh, work through your homework. All right. So uh, yeah, as, as John said, thanks uh, for joining us. Um, we're just going to do a quick review of the homework. Um, a lot of the answers to the questions are going to be fairly similar because uh, a lot of a lot of what's important about photogrammetry is about the is from the data capture side. Um, you know, you can capture uh, really good data and get a bad model, but it's tricky. And you can capture bad data and get a good model, but it's tricky. Uh, best thing to do is just to capture good data in the first place. So. Um, if you've identified that there's something wrong with the mesh that you've generated using either the um, the depth maps or the dense cloud uh, method, um, the first thing that I would look at is the data that you've collected. Um, as we've talked about uh, a couple of times, um, the most important thing for capturing image data is that it be well lit uh, and sharp and have good overlap um, from photo to photo. And the best way to ensure that that we've found is taking photos about every second uh, as you move around an object. If you go through and you find that some of your photos aren't aligning or you get that scary uh, error message that comes up at the very end that says some of your photos haven't aligned and you find that it's actually quite a few of them, not just one or two, um, take a look at the photo data that you've, uh, you've collected. Make sure that it's not blurry. Make sure that it's well lit. Um, and when those things are done, um, you can uh, you know, that's, that's a pretty good starting spot. Um, the other thing to take into consideration is um, that you need to consider sort of the equipment that you have, um, both like your computer and your camera um, and the software that we're using when you're selecting a target. So um, if there's holes in your mesh, it may be a result of having an object that is either shiny or transparent, meaning like a window, um, a cell phone, a screen. I saw somebody did um, actually did the camera that they used for photogrammetry as a photogrammetry model. And surprisingly, or not surprisingly, uh, the uh, back screen didn't come in very well. It's because it's very reflective. Um, I think somebody mentioned putting a matte screen protector on the back um, as a method of improving that. And that certainly, um, that could help. Um, but again, even textures are just as difficult. What the software is looking for is um, unique textures that it can use to position all of the photos. So if you can't pick out a specific point on an object as you sort of turn around it, it's not likely to either. Um, repetitive patterns also sometimes cause issues um, with meshes, um, like very, very repetitive. Uh, even something that is as irregular as say, uh, like a dish towel will probably come in okay. 
um, but something like a, uh, a metal pattern that is really like very precisely identical across the entire surface is unlikely to work well. So if there's holes in your mesh, you can check out your image data or you can check out your target. Maybe you can always, you can always try a, a different subject or different camera equipment if you have access to that or adjusting the lighting condition or environment that you're creating your model in. Um, some of you also identified um, artifacts in your mesh. And when I say artifacts, I mean something that appears in your model that's not actually there, that seems to be sort of um, an accident of how the software works. So um, someone had a nice model. It was like a humanoid figure and um, sort of by the legs, it had a, it had grabbed, Metashape had grabbed a little bit of um, the background and put it in as sort of a white blob. Now, this is a really common issue that we have in underwater photogrammetry because basically everything that we're modeling uh, comes with a even green or blue background. Um, and that is basically the software not knowing what to do with something that doesn't have a lot of contrast in it. So the best thing to do is to just avoid that. So um, generating uh, your mesh from the depth maps will sometimes resolve that issue right off the bat, um, just because the depth maps is generally uh, a little bit better about ignoring background stuff. However, if you want to use the dense cloud method, some people have found that that's creating better results for the particular models that they're generating, um, you'll need to do some manual cleanup. Um, Keith has a good question in the YouTube uh, chat, says, for example, an image is well lit from sun on one side. If the other side has dark shadows, would you use a video light to help light up the shady side so you can pick up the details? And yeah, that's exactly what um, I would suggest doing. If you're modeling something and it has uneven lighting, um, you're going to want to do your very best to even that lighting out. Um, you'll find that if they're, if you're modeling something that has very bright and very dark spots, typically the dark spots will not be modeled uh, and the light spots will be. Um, and that's just because your camera is going to adjust for uh, the exposure of the bright areas. And that's going to cause the dark areas to be so dark that they don't actually contain the image data that Metashape needs in order to um, create a model. So uh, evening out that lighting, bringing uh, everything as close to sort of a cloudy day as possible. Um, that's our ideal. A cloudy day um, is ideal because the clouds themselves are diffusing the light from the sun. They're sort of scattering it so it comes from every direction. They're minimizing dark spots um, and lighting things up uh, as, as, you know, in as, as good a way as we have found. So if you are still struggling with mesh uh, and it's not coming together and you'd like to try again, um, keep in mind sort of the uh, recommendations that we've been giving you throughout the class. Um, try choosing an object with a non-reflective rough texture, uh, no transparencies either. Try, you could try taking a couple more pictures. Generally, we recommend about 50 to 60 pictures, maybe 70 at the most. Um, you could try maybe up to 100, but keep in mind that um, if you choose to take more pictures, um, your processing times are going to go up. And if you need to make an adjustment, it may be a couple of days rather than a couple of hours in order to retry. Things that we've found um, work really well sort of for these introductory level models uh, are anything sort of made out of an organic material, like a leather boot works quite well, usually because it's got a little bit of uh, texture on it, where um, or a rock or a stump, um, trees, and again, organic uh, materials tend to have quite a few um, good uh, contrast points. Uh, sofas also tend to work quite well, um, even sort of smooth sofas that you might not think work super well um, generally do actually work all right as long as they're well lit. Um, things that you might have laying around your house that you might think work well but don't, uh, cooking pan, a uh, scuba cylinder, if it's got a shiny texture, uh, or for example, your car, or maybe a moped would be a really challenging one, yeah, as John has found. That, 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 um, that's just be because they've, yeah. got, they've got that shiny paint, and they've got those transparencies in the headlights, uh, and in the windshield, and the windows. Um, so undoable? Absolutely not. You can make a model out of that. It just takes a lot more work. Um, Neil says, 
uh, in the YouTube chat um, that he had to manually delete a lot of the noisy dots in the dense cloud before generating the mesh. And that's exactly what we want to do, right? Um, so we can use our own uh, eyes to make better sense of what is and what isn't the model because the software doesn't really isn't really able to make that decision for yourself. Um, so if you can come in and make that decision for the software before the generation of the mesh, you can um, generally create a better mesh than you would otherwise. And that's the manual cleanup process that we've been talking about. Okay. So, um, John, we yeah. want to move yeah. on? Um, I'm just going to cover something. So John on the chat had just asked um, about images that are not contrasty enough. Um, honestly, I would not do any processing of images prior to pulling them into Agisoft. Um, the the more times that the more processing you, that you do to any imagery before pulling it into Agisoft, the less well it is going to work. Um, Agisoft will work with kind of adjusting contrast internally anyway it can see the raw data that you're putting into it um anything that you do is generally just going to mess up its ability to uh compare one photo to the to the other um so the best thing to do is to try to avoid capturing bad data um there's a lot of bodges that we can try and do after we've got the data but most of the time the best thing to do is just make sure you've got good data to start with um, um... There is, uh, you know, there is also uh, if you do need to make small adjustments, um, the most that I would do, you know, as John said, I think adjusting it outside of uh, MetaShape is really not a great idea because um, a lot of times that can adjust the geometry or it can um, mess something up for the mm -hmm. for the program that actually the program is designed to compensate for. Um, but there is a small uh, brightness and contrast adjusting tool within MetaShape that can help out a little bit. But again, as John said, generally, if you're relying on that to make your images work, they probably weren't going to work um, in the first place, unfortunately. So um, we, uh, I'm going to speak for both of us here, but we generally um, don't work super hard on the processing side unless we can't get back to the area to capture more data. Yeah. Um, it's always better to capture the best data that you can. Sometimes you just can't get back there. The site's really inaccessible, it's in a remote area, or I think, John, you actually had one model underwater that was destroyed uh, or like recovered immediately after you created the 3D yeah. model. Yeah, yeah um, exactly. So in that case, of course, you're going to work as hard as you can uh, to make those images work. Um, but uh, the the most important thing is to capture the best image data you possibly can, because if you do that, uh, processing is going to be absolute breeze. If you don't do that, it's going to be an absolute nightmare. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we'll move on. And you know, guys, please do carry on um, throwing questions into the YouTube chat as we go. Um, we'll try and pick them up as we go along. Um, but as um, yeah, yeah, we, and we're we're going to talk briefly about underwater photogrammetry at the end of this session. But um, it is a massive topic. It is not an easy task, um, which is one of the reasons why we created a class about it. Um, so uh, we, yeah, we'll we'll cover that a bit more later, and then in the real uh, GUE class. Um, so we have a mesh now, um, and we're gonna we're gonna start thinking about now putting the uh, photographic texture back on top. However, before we do, we need to have a little think about what it is that we're trying to achieve with the model. If we're trying to upload it into um, a uh, an online platform, something like Sketchfab, which is what we we're, we're going to talk to you about tonight, um, we need to make sure that the model is small enough to actually upload. Now, uh, Sketchfab, as with many things, has various different subscription models. Um, they have a free model, a free subscription. Sorry, um, so this doesn't cost you anything, um, but you're limited on how many uploads you can do per month, um, and you're also limited on how big each upload is. And the limit that you have um, on Sketchfab um, is uh, a 50 megabyte model. And the thing with a 50 megabyte model is that that's approximately 1.2 million faces in your mesh. So if your mesh is higher resolution than that or ha has more faces than that, we need to shrink that mesh down. Um, so you can see here, I've got a model, and if you look at where my cursor is, we can see I've got seven, just under 7.4 million faces on this 
scooter model. Okay, so what I need to do is I now need to do what we call decimating the mesh. Um, and we do this up in tools. So in the tools menu, you come down to the mesh, and then you see this option decimate mesh. So what decimate means is it's basically going to reduce the number of faces. And it does this very uh, bluntly. This is definitely a, a, a sledgehammer to crack a walnut kind of territory in that it basically averages the surrounding meshes to make them in, uh, surrounding faces on the mesh to make them into one face. So in this case, I'm taking it from 7.395 million down to 1.2 million. So 1,200,000 faces and I hit OK. If you hit yes at this point where it says replace default model, it will get rid of the high resolution model out of your equation. If you say no, then it will generate a new, it will, it will decimate the mesh and generate a new mesh at that, uh, at that size. So whilst that's uh, thinking, um, I'm going to uh, vanish that and we will uh, start looking at building the texture. Um, so building the texture, again, we're going back into our workflow menu. Uh, we, we need to, what we're asking the software to do is look at every single triangle that is on that mesh that you've made and then look at the photographs that we used when we took the original images and try and find the best bit of that photo, cut it out as a little triangle and then glue it onto the mesh. Um, so this is going to bring back the original colours of the photo. I know a number of people on the Facebook group mentioned that um, they were the the meshes seemed a bit blurry or, or or stuff like that. That's because it's not photographic yet. It was just an average colour of the bot the dots in that area. Um, what we're doing with the texture is we're bringing back that high resolution photographic data and sticking it back on. Um, so it can give a much more apparent detail. It doesn't necessarily put more data into the 3D, but it, at least for the human eye, it looks like there's going to be more data there. It looks more accurate. Okay, so when we're looking at this, we're going we're gonna to bring up the build texture um, window, and we have various options as, as we do in everything else. Pretty much the best thing to do is leave all of this as it comes up as a default. Um, you'll probably, I think it comes up as diffuse, map, images, generic, and mosaic. Um, leave all of those alone. The texture size here um, comes down to how much detail you want in it. If you increase this texture size, it will increase the size of the file, the, the image that it basically puts onto the outside of the model. But by doing so, it massively increases the amount of processing that's required. Um, I think the default is around 4,000 pixels. Um, so, yeah, for me, I would just leave that alone, leave that on the default. Um, you see that you've got here a kind of a texture size and count. So if we've got a really big model where we want a lot of detail, rather than trying to make one big texture file, we'll actually increase the number of texture files that we have. So we could actually have four or six or eight or 20 images that size that it then uses to stick on. Okay, let's see if... Right, so we're back up. So I now have my... Uh, in fact, here's the new one. Uh, 1.199986 million faces. So that's pretty much exactly what we want. <laughs> um, so to do the text texture, workflow menu, build texture, and as I said... Uh, just leave all of this um, kind of on the defaults. Under advanced, um, there's a couple of options there. Again, I would just leave them as defaults. And then if you do that, I will. Here's one I prepared earlier. Uh, no, where is it? It's that one. Uh, textured model. There we go. And what we can now see is if I zoom, actually zoom in on a bit of this, it it really brings up the. Uh, the the high quality element there so if i that's my mesh and we can't even re we can't read the uh the data on this historic tax disc <laughs> um and when i bring up the uh the pick the the textured we can now get that data off that off that tax disc okay so that's what we're aiming for with the texture <coughs> texturing shouldn't take too long it's certainly a lot shorter than either the mesh or the um 
or the dense cloud stage. If it starts taking too long or if it starts crashing, um, it can sometimes be an issue with not enough RAM. And this is, again, one of the reasons why we try and keep the texture size relatively low. That if you want to do big textures, you need a lot of um, RAM in your machine to do it. <clears throat> okay, so the next thing we're now going to do is we're going to look at taking our model and um, publishing it. So I'll hand back to Case at this point. Yeah, thank you, John. Um, so um, as we said at the top, the most important thing about photogrammetry is showing off what you've done. Uh, so the best tool that we've found for this, I mean, there's a number of different ways that we can do this. We can either, we can display it and, um, you know, you can 3D print something, um, you can take a screenshot and share it online. Um, but those two things are at uh, dramatically different ends of the difficulty spectrum, right? Taking a screenshot is very easy, um, but it doesn't really show off the fact that the model is 3D. Um, and 3D printing a model uh, is super cool. Um, but you have to be near somebody to share it. And also, it's quite difficult um, if your model is not um, flawless, as is often the case, at least with my models. Um, so the best compromise that we've found is uh, Sketchfab, which is sort of just like an image host for 3D models. And fortunately, they do have a free um, tier, as John mentioned, uh, in order to host sort of small models um, without without costing you anything. So um, what we're going to want to do in order to um, publish things to Sketchfab um, is to sign up. And the easiest way to do that is just www.sketchfab.com slash sign up. Um, we've dropped a link in the Facebook group if you don't want to copy from a screen or listen to me, uh, although I hope you listen to me a little bit more at least. Um, once you're signed up for that, um, we're going to actually be able to uh, set up for the publishing, right? We need that account first um, in order to, uh, to to move on. And we just want to make a quick note. Um, if you're having any issues or you, um, you may have an issue here if you don't have the open SSL library installed. I believe we talked about this in session one, um, but we just want to jump forward um, there one more slide, John. Um, again, uh, we can actually, I'm not sure if that link is in the Facebook group, but I'll be sure to drop it in shortly. I just, um, I just stuck it up there, it, so it should be, I just threw it in today, just, just underneath the Sketchfab link as well, so. Okay, great, great. So John dropped it in the Facebook group. Um, so just be sure that that is installed, and if you run into an error um, saying something about the OpenSSL uh, error, um, then just go ahead and install that. Generally, Mac and Linux users uh, don't need to do this, and many Windows users uh, don't need to do this as well. Um, but it is a common enough issue um, that it's important to note. So if you run into an OpenSSL error, just go ahead and uh, install the OpenSSL library. Uh, okay. be, oh, sorry, Chris, so um, be, be aware that if, right once you, if, if you do need to install it, you may need to install it twice because there is some oddity with how the installer works that um, sometimes the first time it doesn't properly uh, set up the permissions, and then when you run it a second time, it works better. Of course. OK, so, um, so we've got our uh, Sketchfab account set up, and we've got the SSL, OpenSSL library installed. We should be basically set up to publish our models um, that we've created. Um, fortunately, uh, we can do that directly from inside of Metashape, um, provided that we have uh, what's called an API key. Um, John, could we jump forward to the... Um... There we go, yeah. Um, so we can do this directly from um, Metashape, provided that we've got the API key. Um, the API key is essentially um, like a password. Um, but for the computer, it contains your username uh, and password data so that people can publish or so that you can publish directly to your account without entering those uh, pieces of information. Um, don't give your API key to anybody that you don't want to publish to your account as you. Um, you can regenerate it, but it's a little bit of a hassle. So um, just go ahead and grab that uh, API key. Once your account is set up, you can do that at sketchfab.com slash settings slash password. Um, and then uh, you can open up this upload data uh, menu. 
Give me one second here. That is under File, as John's going to demonstrate, Upload Data, uh, Upload Model. And you'll get this dialog. And you see the dialog uh, in the presentation. You see it in front of you. The first thing that we want to do is make sure that the source data is set correctly, because by default, it'll want to upload your point cloud, which, while cool, is not spectacular, uh, not as cool as a textured uh, mesh. So go ahead and switch that to model. Um, we can keep the raster transform set to none, and you'll want to update your title and description. Now, if you upload multiple models um, to Sketchfab, um, it's important to know that the title and description won't change. So it's very easy to upload um, multiple models with the same title and description. So uh, I would recommend um, just double checking on that as a matter of course um, so that you don't upload a moped uh, and say that it's a famous World War II shipwreck or something like that. Um, so once your title and description are in, um, you'll want to paste that API key that you copied from Sketchfab. Again, sketchfab.com slash settings slash password. And there is a little link here in the upload data dialog if you forget um, how to get to the API key. So that's pretty straightforward. Um, you can, if you are uh, using a, a paid account, do a couple of additional uh, items. Um, but if you're using a free account, um, it'll just upload as a it'll upload by default as unpublished. So you have a second to uh, make adjustments to it uh, online um, before it sort of goes public. Um, when you paste that API key in, I would also um, recommend that you keep the uh, remember API key checkbox checked. And if you do that, the next time you come back. Um, the API key will already be in there. Um, if you are worried about security or you're really worried about somebody uploading to your Sketchfab account from your computer, then you can uncheck that and copy paste it every time. No big deal, but I don't see a big uh, issue there personally. OK, so once you hit OK, um, it'll start uploading the model. Um, and you'll uh, it'll work through the process. And when it's done, um, you'll get an email inside in your um, inbox. Uh, your email inbox, the one that you signed up for Sketchfab with, saying that it's sort of done processing um, and it's ready for you to make manual adjustments. Um, there are a couple of manual adjustments that we recommend that you do um, before you sort of publish the model to everyone. Um, and John's going to go over those um, with you. Yeah. So the most important one is that when you upload your model initially, it will almost inevitably not be the right way up. Um, in this case, it's kind of on its side. And the thing with Sketchfab is it's unlike Agile software, you have full 360 degrees in every direction uh, movement. You don't have that in Sketchfab. It limits you to certain certain rotations. So I can't, for example, here, rotate it kind of on, on axis in front of me on the screen. So if you don't fix your rotation um, correctly, then it's really hard for people to look at the model and it, you know, it's kind of upside down. So you're going to follow the link that you get um, from uh, the email from Sketchfab, and you're going to go to this um, control up here called Edit 3D Settings. And when you click Edit 3D Settings, it's actually going to pull you into the, the Sketchfab editor. OK, so a few things here. Um, if you have a scroll wheel, you can use it for zooming in and out. If you don't, um, then you can use uh, control and click and drag to go in and out. Uh, shift and drag makes you move up and down or for, on a PC. Right clicking does the same. And then just left clicking and standard rotating will move, will move your, your model around. However, what I want to do is I want to rotate the underlying model here. And you can see in this general tab, the first tab we get to, it says straighten model. This would be fine if my model was exactly 90 degrees out. I could just use the left or right click buttons to kind of fit it to where I need it to be. But even there, you can see it's not, it's still not actually flat to how it needs to be. So we're going to click show advanced rotation. And what I can do here is I can basically now, once I click it, I get a trackball thing, a bit like what we have in Agisoft. And I can use the trackball, and I can grab the, the trackball handles to then 
look at this and go, how are we doing? I can rotate myself around a bit and keep tweaking it until it's kind of where I want it to be and it matches the uh, the floor underneath. Yeah, what I like to do um, here, I don't know about you, John, is just I, I like to bring that floor up. You can do that with the, yeah. um, the so, blue arrow handle. Uh, yeah, yeah. so we can bring that all the way up and then... And... Bring that floor up and, and bring it very close to your model. It's very easy at that point to see um, what rotation settings you need. And um, I just I, I always like to reiterate this because this is a uh, this is I think very important. Um, if you don't do the advanced rotation right, it's really hard for people to navigate around your model. It'll be really confusing, uh, and and sort of all of your hard work will go to waste. Um, it's sort of like taking a really nice painting and uh, showing it off. Um, you know, in an alleyway or something like that. Um, so put your best foot, foot, foot forward and do just one little last step. It'll make a big difference in how professional, yeah. how good your model looks um, when it goes to showing it off to your friends. Yeah. And please note that um, if, I'm, if I click anywhere else on the screen, I'm rotating the entire world around. It's only if I'm clicking on one of the handles on the trackball that, the mod, that my, my model actually gets rotated. And once you've finished with that, unclick the show advanced rotation because then that stops you being able to mess it up again later and um, the other things that we can do here are we can change the shading we can change the background one of the things i quite like to do is switch to an image background so that you have kind of a, a bit of a, a background image um if you use one of the um, paid for versions of uh, Sketchfab. If you have a paid for account with Sketchfab, you can um, also add your own logos and, and stuff into these. Um, or they have environmental variables. Um, you can leave them. Um, and these can enable you to do shadows and stuff. We can change the lighting as well. So we can go in, we can hit the lighting button. And in this case, um, I'm using this uh, road in Dordogne as my background. So I can now actually rotate it around and you can see that as I rotate it around the shadows are actually moving on the uh, on, on on the thing um, and you can you can also set it up so that um, that uh, the shadows move around the lights move around there's a whole lot of stuff that you can play with in here the one other nice thing about sketchfab is that it's already virtual reality ready so I have here this this is where it has uh, arbitrarily stuck my virtual reality person. What I want to do is I actually want to start it stood here. Um, I want to um, rotate my, my person so that it's facing the front. And I want to scale it so it's about the right kind of height. So let's, yeah, let's put it somewhere around, I don't know, around there. So this means that now if you visit the Sketchfab website using a virtual reality headset, so either an Oculus or an HTV Vive or even a Google Cardboard system, um, that you can visit this model and view it in virtual reality, and that's the starting point. <clears throat> the last thing that I like um, to do... Oh, go on, Case. Oh, yeah. No, no, finish it, and then okay. I'll uh, take yeah. the question real quick. I'm I was going gonna... to say, the last thing I like to do is um, I go back to the general tab. I kind of like to set a nice-looking... Um, starting point and I click here on the save view button and um, this will save the the location that I'm currently at and then when you open that website um, it will pull it up into that position if you have not yet published the model if this is the first time of doing it what you'll see up here where it says save settings is it will say publish and save um, so in this case I want to save the settings um, the model is already published so it's it's already there um, I just wanted to take a quick question. Um, uh, uh, I'm going to butcher your name, and I'm sorry. Uh, Rositslav uh, is asking uh, how to adjust um, the up and down in Agisoft. Um, you can do that. Um, in general, it's just not that important um, because in um, Metashape, Roscoe, yeah, easy enough. Um, in in Metashape, uh, because MetaShape is not like it's it doesn't care which way is up or down. In general, you don't need to do um, that adjustment unless you're doing something very specific, like generating an ortho mosaic. Um, if you do that, um, you can um, it'll it'll sort of make some default assumptions that are pretty good. Um, you can also use scripts to adjust the up and down relative to um, some other things, um, but that's. 
uh, advanced topic. Um, it's not really necessary for probably the first good chunk of um, 3D modeling that you're doing. Um, I don't know if you found an easier way to do that, John, uh, um, but the only way that yeah, I can do it. I can, show, I, I can show a quick um, thing on this. That um, So if we notice here that I've got my model here, um, I don't really care about whether or not it's parallel to the region, but I can see that my X, Y, and Z here are not correct. Um, one way is you can do is um, you go onto model predefined views and let's go front. And now you can actually come up here with um, rotate object and you can actually kind of rotate your object in if you feel the need to do so, so that it's facing the front. Um, but again, exactly as Kay said, it's kind of irrelevant because Agisoft doesn't care. The only time we really care is if we're doing geo-referencing, which you can't do within the standard version of the software. You need the professional version of Agisoft. And then the pro version of Agisoft has a lot of good ways of scaling this model and, and correctly allocating the, the X, Y, Z. Um, so yeah, but uh, if you're a bit OCD and you definitely, definitely want to get it get it tuned in then you can do it with the move object um tag uh, sorry rotate object tag on the uh, on the taskbar um so once you've got your sketchfab model um edited the right way up and that you know you can you can check that it's it's the uh, that it, it's working correctly by just hitting the reload button and seeing how your model appears on screen so it should spin in and then give you the model. Um, you can also edit, do edit properties on here, and you can add in more um, details, whatever you like. You can add in tags to make it findable. Um, make sure that the status here is published, otherwise no one else can see it. Um, one of the ways that you can get around the upload limits on Sketchfab uh, with the free account is if you make it downloadable, then... Um, then uh, every, for every model that you make downloadable, Sketchfab basically allows you to upload one more model um, per month. And the other thing that we have on the window here is you'll see here the share button. If you hit the share button, you will see the sketch a, a link that you can then copy and paste into a post, or you can even just click on the share to Facebook button, and it will it will do its thing. Um, so it makes it super easy to to share your models there. And it's pretty cool with Facebook um, because there is uh, like embed integration, so people will be able to view the model without sort of leaving Facebook. Uh, not you know in absolute maximum resolution, but uh, it is it is pretty well integrated there. Yeah. Um, cool. So that is kind of you know the the final step, let's say, of getting your model up and up and loaded, and get hopefully you get lots of likes from 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 your friends and Facebook about it. Obviously, at that point, you can then tell them all that you know you learned everything you knew from from Case and myself, and uh, send them our way. So that's always good. Um, so uh, where did I? We had some. I thought we had some homework on there somewhere. Yes, we do. So we're going to give you a little bit of uh, final homework to do, which is to take the models that you made, yeah, put those uh, textures on them, upload them to Sketchfab, and then share them into the Facebook group, and of course on your own Facebook pages and stuff as well, um, so that people get some interest going on um, uh, Imad, if you want to post it on Instagram as a video how can you export such a thing um, it is a tricky task that um, there is there are some animation tools within Agisoft um, we're not going to cover them at the moment but there are some Agi um, animation tools within um, Agisoft but um, getting that video into Instagram is another um, task in itself. Um, I don't know if you've already looked at putting in, uh, videos in, but I find that I have to uh, upload it in a format that my phone can um, can view, uh, can can understand, and then use my phone to stick it onto Instagram. So it's a bit of a pain in the bottom. Um, right, where are we? Um, I'm going to run into the blatant plugs at this point. Um, again, feel free to carry on typing up questions as they appear. Um, we'll throw up the discount stuff at the moment uh, in a minute. Um, 
But um, Case and I are both uh, active GUE instructors. We both travel. Uh, I'm based in the UK and Case is based in Seattle in the US. Um, so if you are interested in any of the GUE classes, um, whether that's the photogrammetry class or uh, the fundamentals class or any of the higher level classes as well, then please do get in touch. Um, please do follow us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, etc., etc. Um, all of this helps us um, get more coverage and get uh, more. Uh, it gives us more reasons for doing more online training. <laughs> um, there is still the uh, online tip jar, uh, tips jar on the Facebook group. Um, again, we are very deeply uh, grateful for anyone who has sent us a virtual beer or virtual coffee. Uh, into that um, so thank you very much to everyone who has already um, and finally on this bit um, as always the Mars project um, is a project that we are both uh, passionately involved in um, and we're supposed to be on in about two weeks time um, I'm supposed to be filling <laughs> gas and loading soft so we both into got our a... flights booked and we'll be on our way shortly yeah um, well Sweden aren't locked down at the moment so yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah that worked out for them yeah um, so uh, yes, uh, you know, thirteen months time we'll be going to Mars. <laughs> um, but in the meantime, please do go and visit the uh, the website. Um, there's all sorts of fun information about the project there, um, and it is some of the most impressive photogrammetry that's ever been done, or at least certainly that I've seen for an archaeological site, let alone an underwater archaeological site. Um, so let's think about taking it underwater um case do you want to talk about this yeah i'd be happy to um so you know uh, for better or for worse uh, well we've been doing a lot of photogrammetry on on, uh, on on land and essentially what we've covered in this online photogrammetry course is a quick review over most of the lectures um, that we cover sort of in the first half of the first day of our GUE photogrammetry course. Um, it's always easier, we find, to do stuff on land um, first uh, before we take it underwater, and photogrammetry is no exception. So just like all of the other GUE courses, um, you know, in our photogrammetry course, we practice stuff on land like we've been doing before we take it underwater. Um, this is because photogrammetry is much, much harder underwater than it is on land. Um, basically, everything that um, we don't have to worry about on the surface um, becomes challenging underwater. So um, lighting on the surface, usually you can just get away with daylight or whatever lights in your room, maybe put one lamp on one side of the object uh, and you're good to go. Underwater, we have to think about strobes, we have to think about video lights if you are um, not in shallow water. And uh, to be honest, in really shallow water with a lot of bright lights and a lot of water around, that can be as challenging or more challenging um, than deeper or darker water. So it's a lot more difficult to get good results with photogrammetry underwater unless you're in sort of ideal conditions. Also underwater, we have the notable uh, disadvantage of the fact that even a relatively easy dive is significantly more complex um, to do than doing it in your living room. Um, so uh, we want to be somewhat reliable in a, being able to capture good data underwater um, in the event that we can't get back there or that the site is disturbed before we're able to capture more data. So um, we developed the GUE photogrammetry course to sort of accelerate the process of um, resolving all of the hassles that come with uh, photogrammetry underwater. Um, uh, you know, I will say, like right off the bat, people say, you know, photogrammetry is a little bit different than something like technical diving, right? If you mess up, the only thing that you lose out on is sort of your time and your sanity. Um, whereas if, you know, you're in a cave or technical diving, um, really, uh, you don't want to have to relearn the lessons that people have learned because they come with significant risks to your health and safety. Um, so, you know, can you learn underwater photogrammetry uh, on your own? Absolutely. However, um, having gone through that whole process myself, having John gone through that whole process myself or himself and uh, some of the other folks that we've talked to that have worked this out on their own, basically it involves quite a bit of hassle um, that we think that we can sort of get you over the hump uh, with. 
so we can sort of accelerate your process towards enjoying yourself and capturing good data um, without having to go through the headaches that we've done. Um, and uh, we have an opportunity to talk about um, photogrammetry, not just in ideal conditions, um, but in you know suboptimal conditions. In a lot of cases, you know, here in Seattle, um, in Sweden, uh, there are really interesting um, targets underwater that exist in limited to zero visibility um, or close to zero visibility. And as long as you can get uh, a picture, even if it's very close, oftentimes you can scan those objects in photogrammetry and create 3D models. So one of the cool things here is underwater um, with the right techniques and right training and so on, uh, you can actually see things that you'd never be able to see in uh, real life. So um, yeah, if you're interested, please get in touch. Um, basically, our training program for photo, uh, photogrammetry is we start off with GUE fundamentals. If you've already done that, then that's great. You can move directly into Photogrammetry Diver. If you haven't, um, GUE fundamentals is sort of our method of introducing uh, our style of uh, team diving so that you can function really effectively as a safe team. Um, and then on that foundation, on that platform, um, we add the photo, uh, photography and photogrammetry skills um the lighting uh positioning uh, and so on and we have the opportunity to go out create models iterate on them over the course of, of a of a four-day class um so that by the end of it you can you know sort of pull off your own uh you pull off your own photogrammetry models on a relatively small scale and and, and build from there onto projects as large as you'd like to so yeah, again, if you're interested in a, a fundamentals or photogrammetry class or any other GUE class, please get in touch with me or John, no matter where in the world you are. Um, we both travel, but we can also put you in touch with local uh, instructors if there's um, someone nearby. Um, uh, you know, we're more than happy to reference you to one of our colleagues. Yeah, absolutely. Well. Um, and I'll also mention, obviously, at the moment, there's a lot of issues in, across the world with us be, you know, being in lockdown, unable to travel, hence why we doing this anyway um GUE have been uh so somewhat proactive um with thinking about uh, managing this and they've now um, extended the registration period on all of the classes um which means that we're we're able to uh online register and start doing online theory at the moment with the diving dates can be done uh, up to 12 months in the future and that may well change depending on how how the world uh, progresses in that time um so if you are considering um, any of the classes, then do, do you know do get in touch, and uh, there's a lot of options for us to be able to get um, theory and even some dry practical sessions out of the way using online technology rather than uh, face to face, and then get together to do the dives as and when we're able to, and utilizing whichever uh, yeah social distancing uh, methods we have to we have to to use. <laughs> Yeah, who who would have thought that we'd have had to? Yeah, the world would have had to create the term social distancing. Uh, but there we go. <laughs> um, just gonna have a quick look through the questions. Yeah, so John uh, John asked about the Open SSL thing, and he was having issues. Uh, it's really important that the version that you install is one point zero point two. The later versions of Open SSL don't actually do the thing that. Um, Agisoft and Sketchfab need to talk to each other, so you need to install version 1.0.2. Um, Leon has a question about the uh, M4 model that you're showing. Uh, it says, uh, uh, is the model in the demo that um, we're showing right now, is it made up of two models, or is it just one? Uh, no, it's one model. The, the, the thing is a rock. It's a rock that's at one end of the wreck. Um, so what you can see there is um, it's a Roman era wreck. It was actually Greek, I believe, um, or we believe. Um, it sank in a rough in roughly 300 BC at a depth of 112 meters off the east coast of Sicily. Um, so this is a project that we scanned over. Uh, well, we we did a couple of years worth of diving on. Um, this was this was a scan from one dive. So it it's not super super detailed, but it's um, detailed enough to make the archaeologists very very excited. Um, and Keith uh, wants us to talk a little bit more about the Mars project. I think we're actually planning on doing a presentation separately on that. But um, I've been involved since 2018. Uh, John's been involved. Longer think, than that. Yeah, 2000, 
16 i think i started with the mars project um the um, uh yeah sorry the photogrammetry team is there's a number of people on on the the photogrammetry team pretty much everybody on the mars dive team um will be doing some amount of photogrammetry um whether it's large scale stuff or just small artifact stuff so uh, pretty much everybody who dives has to have at least some concept of what photogrammetry is um in terms of we use it yeah go on case oh sorry yeah we just use it we use it super extensively because on that project um the dive it's sort of a uh, it's a perfect um sort of opportunity for us to use these skills um, because we have a lot of scientists who are very interested in um, what we're seeing, um, but we also can't actually get them to the dive because it's quite cold and it's quite deep. So photogrammetry allows us to go down and scan objects um, and bring them to the surface so that the scientists can look at them in the way that they actually want to rather than the way that we think that they want to, which is mm -hmm. typically not perfect. Um, so basically, you know, that, that model is a collaboration. Um, it's headed up by uh, Ingemar Lundgren, um, the brother of, the, of Richard Lundgren, who you may know. Um, he's done the diving on it and a lot of the processing, um, but the actual data capture has been done by probably 20 to 25 divers over the course of a decade. Um, it's really a huge collaborative project um, that, uh, you know, I, I am proud to have been a small part of. Yeah. Um, and cu currently on the on the kind of the, the the project as we're moving forward, um, we have about I guess three or four people who are primarily there to capture photogrammetry data, um, and then a number of other divers obviously are the teammates and um, for those divers, and then we also are doing other stuff as well. So we're doing exploration, we're doing traditional survey, we're doing media photography, all this kind of stuff. Um, so uh, yeah. Uh, so that's that's the Mars, um, and as Kay said, we're we're actually going to consider trying to put together a a Mars presentation um, at some point, probably in a couple of weeks' time, um, to the and um, that will go out on the group and the email list so that everyone gets some warning of it. Um, Neil is asking, can we talk a little bit about using targets or survey control points underwater to improve accuracy? Uh, no is the answer the short answer we could talk a lot about it um we actually spend about probably two hours of the gue class talking about um survey techniques and targets and markers and scales and stuff um it's not an easy topic um it's something that is useful um and is uh but is a pro level thing on the software as well so we don't spend we, we don't put a lot of input into that because you need to have the pro versions of the software but uh, there is quite a lot that you can talk about with that uh john has asked was this from video or photos uh, i'm assuming you're talking about the model um that we've got on screen this is from photos that's from still photos um and did i shoot this circular or crisscross uh yes a uh, combination of both basically yeah, basically uh you'll find that basically any project that's beyond a sort of a trivial size um, uses a combination of patterns and sort of working out exactly the best way to um, move across a model and capture it um, is something that takes some time to develop um, sort of your intuition for. Um, but yeah, there's a combination, I think, for almost every model that I've ever made underwater. Yep. Okay. So let's move on to this. And again, please feel free to throw more questions up as we do this. Um, so we have some special discounts coming on. Now, before you get all excited and start wanting um, uh, discount codes, pretty much all of these come um, by you. Well, you get you get the details of these if you just email me, john at Um But the discounts that we got are basically a 10% discount on any Agisoft Metashape license. Um, there's a 15% discount on Fourth Element Leisureware, um, and I can, I, if you email me, I'll send you a unique code for for their uh, online shop. 10% uh, discount on the Powerlens Plus camera, um, which are awesome little uh, action cameras, uh, underwater action cameras. Um, again, email me, and I can send you a code. 10% uh, discount on Deox Zip O2 Nitrox analyzers, while stocks last on that one. Um, and then special pricing on both Apex MTX RC twin set regulator sets and on Halcyon MC pack, uh, MC sets. 
So that'd be backplate wing and all the all the bits. Um, but you'll get those discounts by emailing me. Um, they will be valid for two weeks from today, basically. Um, uh, real quick, uh, yes. Neil makes a good point. Um, just to briefly mention, uh, you know that. If you are associated with an educational institution, um, sometimes you can get a discount on um, MetaShape. It's a fairly substantial educational discount. I don't know, uh, uh, John is a, is a distributor for MetaShape now. Um, we were able to get that educational discount because we teach this course. Uh, I know other people um, have been able to get that discount for other reasons, but I know some, you know some folks that are just like students that are not associated with photogrammetry have not. Um, so you can sometimes get that discount, but uh, retail pricing does apply for most folks. So if you are interested in getting it, um, I think John can you can yep. arrange the educational pricing as well. I can, yeah. Um, but the easiest thing to do to get the like the best price on this um, is really just get in touch with John. Um, that's that's going to be your best bet. Yep. Um, cool. So, uh, what have we done today? Uh, what we've failed to do is edit that slide correctly, but never mind. So, we had a look at the homework, we had a look at the meshes, um, we've built the texture, we have looked at publishing the model to Sketchfab and how to share that with uh, Facebook um, or whatever. Um, and we've had a quick look at taking it underwater. Um, it is very addictive doing this stuff um you guys have probably found this out uh, if you're stuck with us for for four sessions um doing it underwater is very addictive but it does take a long um it does take a lot of effort on the dives and a lot of um swearing so this is why as as case said uh, we created the GUI class was to try to avoid an element of that swearing and get you up and running a bit faster um and then we've obviously looked at the plugs and the special discounts um Leon, will the class sessions stay online? They will for at least for a couple of weeks. Um, I don't know whether we'll leave them online longer than that, um, it, it, but uh, they'll they'll stay online for at least two weeks. Um, cool. So, if anyone has any other questions, then we will gladly uh, take them. I love the 20 second YouTube delay as well. <laughs> um. All right. It doesn't seem like we have any other questions. Um, we're not going anywhere because our government's mandate that we don't. Um, so uh, if you've got any other questions, feel free to drop them into the Facebook group. Uh, and uh, we'll answer them as soon as possible. Um, some of you have also, I know at least some people have contacted me directly, uh, and I certainly don't mind that, um, but because John and I are in different time zones, you're likely to get a more timely answer uh, if you drop it in the Facebook page, um, just because uh, John is up when I'm asleep and I'm up when John's asleep a lot of the time. <laughs> yeah. uh, Keith, uh, I've just seen a question from Keith. I couldn't find it on the Facebook page. I'm not sure what it um, what you're it talking is. about there. Um, so if you want to um, either jump up back up or stick a question onto the Facebook group, and we'll uh, we'll answer it there. Um, so yes, thank you everybody for sticking with us through these sessions. Um, please do, if you know of anyone who might be interested, you can forward them. Uh, or, or please uh, forward them the sign up link for the email um, list or for the Facebook group. Um, please don't just um, forward them the uh, YouTube links. Um, it's just uh, easier for us to, to be able to answer questions and, and keep things going if, if people are in touch with us. Um, ah, the tips jar. Yes, I will fix the tip. I will make sure the tips jar jumps back to the top. That's fine. We'll get that going in a second. That's very important. Uh, Lewis or Louis, uh, will there be more than one course level at the moment? Um, no, there's just the one photogrammetry program. Um, we <laughs> people keep asking me this. Um, I don't think we're going to create a another layer of class as such, but we are certainly um, going to be running um, master classes and stuff um, as and when it's appropriate. Um, 
for example, I mean, I have one that um, I'm going to be doing. This will be very nice. It's in uh, Truck Lagoon in November 2021. So it's kind of a whole photogrammetry uh, session thing going on for the for, for a ten day project, uh, well, project ten day trip out there where we'll be talking photogrammetry a lot of the time. Um, otherwise, again, around the GUE conferences, we tend to do stuff and, and, and we'll be putting more and more stuff together as we get more and more photogrammetry divers going on. Yeah, I think um, um, in complete agreement with John, you know, uh, we've talked about having a second level of the class um, before, um, but it, 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 photogrammetry is much less uh, strict and it changes on a evolving basis as the software gets updated. Um, so it lends itself um, really well to sort of a workshop format. So if you have had photogrammetry training and you would like more uh, in-depth detail or uh, help on a particular project, you know, don't don't hesitate to get uh, in touch with either John or myself, um, and we can set something up. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, what else, uh, Kelly? Uh, yes, I would be more than happy to come to South Africa for a fundies and or photogrammetry class. So, uh, yep, uh, just get in touch. I'm sure Case would also be happy. Uh, once, obviously, right flights on are, once we're allowed once to travel there again. there are flights there. <laughs> yeah. Um, Annika, absolutely, thank you. Yes, um, we, we, we also thank hope you, that Annika. everything settles and we can all catch up. Um, and our our then... uh, photogrammetry class for Annika was very poorly timed. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I think it was supposed to take place like two weeks ago. Nice. Yes. Okay, well, that, that, that a poor second, I'm afraid, then Annika, there with the uh, with our, <laughs> um, our online training, but uh, it will hold you in good stead for once we can actually get to get it running. Um, all right, cool. Well, if I not seeing any other questions coming in, um, we will uh, sign off now on the YouTube stream, and we'll be over on the Facebook uh, group um, where I'm trying to find the link to that tips jar. Uh, don't know what's happened it, to it. It is, it it is be there. in um, the list of... Uh, is it in the pinned? ...that I dropped in there. Um, it's just you have to click See More, and it's uh, okay. under all the various social media links. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'll just drop it in the YouTube chat. Yeah, you just stick, stick it in there, and uh, I'll... Oh, here we go. This... Always appreciated. Indeed, absolutely. Um, great. So thank you very much, everybody. Um, and I will hit the end button.